Thanks. Well, this is interesting, doing a virtual conference. I've done a few virtual presentations, but uh, um, workshops, I've done workshops in the past, and, you know, they really intended to be interactive. I um, encourage you to turn your cameras on if you have one so we can see that we're at least talking to humans. Um, that would be nice. It adds a personal touch to it. Don't be afraid. Um, and uh, it is a workshop, so hopefully you know, we can be in as interactive as possible. You know, feel free to interrupt. Um, there are everybody does have reaction buttons. If you're if you're not familiar with Zoom, down on the bottom of your screen is a little reactions, and and you can uh, uh, click on that, and you can put a hand or a clap or a heart or a <laughs> happy face, whatever you want to do it to kind of get our attention if you want to, or if you just feel like engaging in some way. Go ahead and give that a try uh, if, if you if you want to. Um, it just stays on for, for a little while. Also, there is a chat. Uh, if you open up chat, you can type something in there. Um, pay attention to who you're typing it to. You, it defaults to everyone. Um, and uh, I encourage you to chat there if you want to do a side conversation, that's possible too. Um, but if you have a question or you can't get our attention, you know, just put something in there. We'll try to keep, try to monitor that and uh, and stop and answer the questions. You know, I want this to be interactive. Um, you know, please engage. You should just be able to unmute and start talking. Um, it, it 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 does focus on whoever is talking. So you know, if I don't take a breath, um, you won't interrupt. So um, do your best to interrupt. Feel free to interrupt and I encourage you to interrupt um, and turn your cameras on please, if you are able, if you have a camera. It's, it's nice to see people. Thank you, Kyle. Nice to see you. All right. Um, okay, well, with that, we'll get started. Um, I'm Randy Knipple. I'm the GIS manager at Dakota County. I uh, got involved in this uh, about 10 years ago. I think it was more than 10 years ago. Uh, and really uh, got involved in it as a way to open the door with uh, emergency managers and first responders. And, you know, it's really a, well, part of our challenge in GIS is uh, being able to show potential customers what we can do for them. And so this was a great way to do that and uh, really been sticking with it and expanding on that, on that since then. Um, so we'll get started, I'm going to do an introduction to the National Grid. This is actually the same presentation that I'm scheduled to give on Thursday. So, you know, if you want to come back and, and hear it again, you're certainly welcome to, but I intend to give the same presentation uh, then as well. Uh, and then BJ will take over and give an emergency manager's emergency response perspective. And then in the third segment, I intend to do a deeper dive on the GIS side. And we'll look at actually how to make maps and what the national grid um, is really all about at a technical level. So get started. Um, and this is a, really a lot of slides that I've given um, to a variety of audiences over the years, um, but including uh, first responders and emergency managers. Now, um, you know, here in this kind of a of a GIS technical setting, um, I can I can I can you know, highlight some things that are are more technical in nature, or GIS related, and I'll try to do that along the way. Um, but when I'm talking to the emergency managers and first responders, I stay out of those weeds, and that's really what this is all about. But you know, over over time, people have become pretty aware now of what GIS is, and in a lot of ways, they think we can do magic. So you know, all of the 3D modeling and analysis and things that we can do, uh, people really start to understand that now. But when we think about GIS for emergency management, we really have to think about this emergency management cycle which is what they're familiar with. And the response phase is after an event when they're trying to, trying to uh, uh, preserve human life. And then recovery is when you're trying to bring things back to normal. Mitigation is when you learn from the event and try to minimize the potential impact of such an event in the future. And then preparation is doing whatever you need to do to be in a better position if something like that happens. So. In emergency management in these different phases, GIS can apply. So in the response phase or after an event, we can get involved in damage assessment, search and rescue. In the recovery phase, helping to track status and help, helping to track resource deployment. In the mitigation phase, 
uh, analyzing the, uh, the, the, the things in the community and uh, providing some different scenarios for resolving uh, any of the problems that occurred. And then preparation, planning, uh, um, tracking the, the, the different resources and uh, elements of the community. But what we really have to think about is right at this point, you can see everybody can see my pointer, I believe. You know what? I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Am I sharing my screen? No. Oh, my. I'm going to back up. Oh, here we go. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> How about now? Yes, now you are. All right. So that's all the cool stuff that we can do that I was talking about. And then here are the different phases of emergency management. And it is a cycle. Now you can see the picture. So it goes around in a circle. Uh, I'm glad I caught it now. <laughs> so now everybody can see my pointer, correct? I'm pointing, it moves around kind of slowly. But right at this point, at the beginning of the response phase, phase is when the event occurs. And what we need to think about is what can we do at that point that is um, most reliable with the, with the least amount of resources, something that we can do uh, very dependably. And, uh, and we need to think about what happens if we don't have electricity or what happens if we don't have computers. And so what that comes down to is maps. And it's not just, and, and these are printed maps. You, know, We wanna have not you know, many sets of maps because we know that every time we print a map, it's out of date. But what we need to have is, a, is, is the right amount of maps printed and distributed so that uh, not only can, can we use them and provide them, but that emergency responders and emergency managers already have them. And not only do they have them, but they've already received training on how to use them. So we teach them about the basic concepts of map reading and land navigation. So it's very fundamental. You know, in a lot of ways, we take these we take maps for granted, and it's something that really was a, kind of an eye opener for me as I uh, was able to get out and and be an observer on some of these uh, emergency manager emergency response exercises. Uh, which you are able to do if you if you are invited to do so, um, they would be talking about the scenario and and how they were deploying resources, and they're all gathered around a table in a in, in a mobile command vehicle, and there are no maps, and it was it was really shocking for me. And so we really help them understand what uh, um, what a map can do for them, helps them relate locations and. Uh, really provide a visual, um, uh, a, a, a visual representation of, of the event. So it's all about teaching them the basic skills of how to use a map. And then we also pre-build these maps so that they're available uh, in, a, in an emergency situation with a minimum amount of resources. And that's really what this is all about. We really focus on two, I've really focused on two different uh, uh, sets of maps. The large maps are one to 24,000 scale, um, 22 by 24 inches. The smaller maps are eight and a half by 11, one to 6,000 scale, one inch equals 500 feet. Um, and and those, those two work really well and you'll see those throughout. And so just teaching them basic uh, concepts of how to use a map. So um, we, we, we teach them to pay attention to the grid numbers. I mean, we have, we put grids on the maps and <clears throat> we teach them that if you want to uh, talk about a specific area or location on the map, you use those numbers and you read right and then read up. And so a given grid square is gonna be called 7556 in this case, reading right to seven five and up to five six. The grid square is referenced using the lower left corner. And then we also then provide these, these smaller scale maps, or larger scale maps, I'm sorry, uh, eight and a half by 11. And uh, if you want more detail, you simply refer to those, those maps. And so where the larger maps have one inch equals 2,000 feet, one to 24,000 scale, you know, we, at that scale, we can show schools and churches and fire stations and police stations and things like that. 
But on the larger scale maps, now we can get down to actually showing buildings, addresses, fire hydrants, street names, and all of that. Um, and so the two map sets really complement each other uh, very well. If you want to find a page in a book for grid square 7456, well, there's a page numbered 7456. And you're able to simply go to that page and then see all of that detail. In the same way, when you're on the detailed page, if you want to describe a smaller area on that page, you simply add another digit to that. So now again, reading right to one up to five, this grid square is called 741565. So with six digits, we've described this square on a page. And all of those all of those maps are uh, come in the form of map books. So we can very easily uh, create a map index. In this case, it's for the city of Burnsville. Uh, it's very easy to pull out all of the pages. These are all, all created as PDF files. Uh, they can very easily be pulled together into a multi-page PDF file uh, so that um, all the pages that a given jurisdiction needs are uh, yeah, are, are in that map book. Now, uh, I said I got involved with this uh, to really open the door with emergency managers and first responders. This really uh, happened, um, uh, it was really driven by our fire chiefs in Dakota County. Um, you know, I've been, been trying to work with uh, uh, emergency managers and the first responders, fire chiefs, police chiefs, and help them understand what GIS was and what kind of data we had in, in GIS in the database. Um, and, and I had given a presentation to our fire chiefs talking about all of this stuff. And I got a call a few days later and one of the fire chiefs uh, called me and he, he said, you know, we've got uh, map books for our city and our neighboring cities have map books and we kind of like our map books. But when, when, when we get called for, got, get called out for mutual aid to go to our neighboring city, um, we really need to see their map books. And, you know, their map books don't look like our map books. Can't we just have map books that are consistent across the entire county? And it, it was really very humbling for me to realize with all the technology that we had, um, we hadn't realized that something that was really pretty basic, elemental for us, um, was something that was essential for them. Um, and so that's what really got the whole thing started. So we created map books for all of our cities, and then all the map books are consistent. They're all PDF files, so we can very easily update them uh, and provide provide updates. Anybody can print an eight and a half by eleven map. They can print pages at home if they need to. Okay, then again, getting back to the the grid numbers. So now, when we're on a page, it's pretty easy within a given grid to estimate uh, breaking that into. Uh, 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 rows of 10 and columns of 10. So by adding one more digit, we can estimate a location on that map and call it 7413565. So again, reading right, then up, we can then estimate over about three and, and up about eight. Now these are all in meters. So what we've actually done is identify a, 10, a, a, a location to a precision of 10 meters and we can reference that as 74135658. And so it's very easy then to see which page we're on because the first two digits, 7456, get me to that page. And on the larger map, it's going to be 75. So all of this works together very logically. It's very easy to teach and, uh, um, and, and it's very useful once, once they get familiar with it. Well, this is all part of a national system. You know, I, I told the story about the fire chiefs and the map books. And uh, at the time, of course, that, that's a very easy thing for us to do, create maps across, an, across the entire county. Um, you know, if you're familiar with ArcMap and, and data-driven pages, ArcGIS Pro has map series. Um, it's really easy once you set, set up the template and set up the areas that you want for the maps to just create all the maps automatically. Um, but I needed to have some kind of a map page system. And, uh, and, and I realized that the US National Grid really, really helped us with that. Um, so the nice thing is that it's part of a national system. And so what you can see is that 
the, the, there's a logical naming system across the entire ent entire country. We'll go into more detail on that, but this is the U.S. national grid. So really, when I'm when I'm giving this kind of a presentation to first responders, emergency managers, I don't even say U.S. national grid until this slide. So take them through that process. And I, I embellished a little bit with some of, the, some of the technical detail for your benefit, but I stay out of the weeds and, and just help them understand this is very easy. It's about basic map reading and, and, and land navigation. But this is a US national grid. The US national grid has been a national standard since 2001. It's been adopted by several federal agencies, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Department of Homeland Security, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the United States Geological Survey. The significance of this is that FEMA and DHS are on the emergency management side of the federal government and the NGA and USGS are on the mapping or geospatial side of the federal government. So both, both sides of that equation have adopted this as a standard. It's also been adopted by several states. I list a few there. It was adopted by Minnesota as a standard in 2009. Um, every state should do the same, adopt whatever, whatever mechanisms you have in Wisconsin for adopting standards, um, the U.S. national grid should be adopted as a standard. Effectively, it is uh, through, through FEMA. Now, the, the U.S. national grid is, in effect, it is actually the military grid referencing system. So this is nothing new. The military grid referencing system has been around since World War II. Uh, it's been proven in the military. It continues to be used in the military. This means that when we make maps and when we train first responders at the local level to use this system, they will be directly interoperable with the National Guard. Um, and all NATO forces uh, use this uh, worldwide. So it's not just a, a national system, uh, it, 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 work, it works worldwide. And in fact, it's nothing more than a convenient notation system for UTM coordinates. So UTM has been around for a very long time. So this is nothing new. Um, people get a little, a little scared about talking about this, this grid system and it's got letters and numbers and it looks kind of strange, um, but it works. And there are good reasons for the, uh, for, for the way that it's been designed. But just remember that these are UTM coordinates, it's nothing new. And so really what's happened is this is a way to present some very complex geospatial concepts about how to map the surface of the earth accurately and present it in a way that's uniform for everybody and easy to, and easy to use. So that's what this is all about. And if we look at uh, the, the USGS maps, the US topo series, uh, they used to make the quad, the quad maps. These are based on quarter quadrangles, but that's why we see the UTM coordinates with these, this kind of notation where you have this, the, the, the superscripts for, uh, for certain digits and you have the, the larger digits for the ones that are, are significant for labeling the grids. That is a grid reference, 6981 is going to be that grid intersection. And in fact, it describes a square. Um, and then the other elements that, that uh, make a map U.S. National Grid compliant, uh, we can see the, the, uh, uh, the little text boxes that describe the grid zone designation in the 100,000 meter square. And then there is always this uh, grid zone designation box. Um, so same, same kind of convention that is used by the USGS. So let's look at this a little bit closer. So here, what we're actually showing are all of the grid zone designations and the 100,000 meter square. So let's look at that a little more detail. First of all, what you can see, uh, the grid zones are, are six degree by eight degree uh, quadrangles. And if you look at this though, we have zone 15U, 15T, 15S, 15R. This is UTM zone 15. And all we've done is break it into eight degree increments um, then you see all of the smaller boxes in red. Uh, those are even 100,000 meter increments of the UTM coordinate system. Um, and each square is given an alphabetic uh, um, designation. 
And I'm not sure if you can see that. You can probably see that. You, you, what you'll notice is if that there's a, ro a column of V all the way up, and then there's rows of M, L, K, or it should do it the other way, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. Um, so these are rows and columns. Um, they are labeled within each UTM zone, and they don't they don't duplicate in the adjacent zones. So there's some good convention, good good reasons for that as a convention. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, so if we look at VK, for example, um, and we look at all the other VKs in the U.S., there are only four, and they are about 800, 800 miles apart. So VK is not duplicated um, for 800 miles in any direction. Um, so what this means is that VK is unique for 800 miles in any direction. If we say, if we know that we're working in Minnesota and we say VK, we know uh, we don't have to really say 15T anymore. So right away we have um, a, um, um, a, a, a abbreviation of the UTM coordinates. So let's look at this a little bit, a little bit more. So USNG coordinate format starts out with the grid zone designation. First of all, let's look at this is actually, if we were to look at the uh, UTM coordinates, it'd be 15N, 15 North, and then 492,220, 4,976,580. Um, so it's, we always have to provide all of those digits, but by using the grid zone, you can see it's, it's zone, UTM zone 15 and then grid zone T. VK is the 100,000 meters square. And so when you see the rest of this now, easting and northing or right and up, that's the numeric portion at a, a precision of 10,000 meters, okay? And so the first thing that, that this does is give us an even number of digits in X and Y. It really takes away these, these, uh, these very large numbers that are really not significant at a, at a local level. We know the area that we're working in. Why do we always have to say 4,900 and then whatever follows that? So it's really a way to abbreviate very quickly 15 TVK gives us that that very large uh, the very large area context, but once we know we're there, we only need to work with the numeric portion. So right away, that's that's the benefit. Um, and so the meters are always going to be in the range of zero to uh, to, to uh, nine 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 nine. So let's just look at that. So 15 T is a six degree by eight degree grid zone. VK is the 100,000 meters square, and that's an even 100,000 meter increment of UTM coordinates. The first digits then is going to take us down to another level of precision. So now we're at a 10,000 meter square, an even 10,000 meters of UTM coordinates. We add another digit, now we're at a, uh, a 1,000 1, meter square. Um, And at another digit, we're at a 100 meter square. Another digit, we're at a 10 meter square. So what that means is that we can choose the number of digits that are appropriate for um, for the given scenario. It also, uh, conversely, if you have um, a, a location to 10, 10, 10 meters of precision or one meter of precision, it's also very easy to be able to scale that up to a larger area simply by dropping digits to the right. So a little bit more about precision and truncation. We can look at a full uh, uh, U.S. National Grid designation. Uh, the U.S. National Grid allows spaces. Um, MGRS um, does not by, the, by convention or by standard, but I think a lot of people do that just for readability. You can insert spaces in a U.S. National Grid uh, um, grid reference. Full uh, precision to one meter is going to be the full 15 characters, but, but we can uh, start to uh, get some efficiencies here. If we know that we're in grid zone 18S, we don't need to say that over and over and over again. We can simply refer to UJ2306. And in that case, UJ is the 100,000 meter square 2306, simply because there are only four digits. We just know by convention, that's a 1,000 meter square. And 
In the same way, we could eliminate the 100,000 meters square uh, if we know that that's our that everything we're doing is within that um, that uh, 100,000 meters square. And now, by simply using the digits and four digits in X and Y, we have 10 meters of precision, assuming the grid zone designation in the 100,000 meters square. So we can pick and choose the level of precision that's necessary. Um, you know, if you're trying to uh, direct a helicopter to a football field, you know, 100,000 meters is probably sufficient. So why do we need this? Well, you know, it's, it, it really gives us a convenient way to design map pages and to be able to have uh, the different sets of maps and be able to teach land navigation and, uh, uh, and map reading. But we really need to think about it for this kind of a scenario where we've lost all visual cues in the field. There are no street signs. There are no, we can't even tell where the streets were. We can't tell where buildings were, um, but we may wanna know, uh, you know, for search and rescue, where was that daycare or where was the pharmacy? Uh, we may have to go and recover some materials or something like that. And how do we track our efforts when we're, when we're out there in this debris field, sending resources out there and how do we keep track of which areas have been cleared and which haven't? Well, the grid basically gives us an overlay for this kind of a debris field. And using GPS now, we can navigate to a, to a given location. We can be aware of some kind of a spatial coverage of that area, 100, or, uh, 10 meter squares or 100, 100 meter squares, um, and be able to designate which squares we've already searched, for example. And everyone gets a unique name. So uh, it's very easy to track this stuff over time. Uh, and, uh, and then using GPS, GPS receivers will all have a setting for uh, either US National Grid, USNG or MGRS. You'll always find MGRS because the military uses GPS, of course. And then not only knowing, knowing where they are, but having maps uh, that, that represent those areas, as well as maps that show how things were before this event occurred. So showing the key resources, critical infrastructure, vulnerable population in our uh, communities on the maps allows them to navigate using those maps um, to given locations. Um, and then to be able to very uh, easily and unambiguously relay those locations over a radio like that. And that's really how the, why the military developed it. You need to be able to have uh, a, a convenient and unambiguous way of relaying locations from forward observation posts back to artillery uh, firing stations so that they would be able to uh, um, locate um, very precisely uh, the targets on, on, on the ground. And there are a lot of parallels, of course, between emergency response and, uh, and the military. And so then teaching them how to read the maps. Um, and then the maps, you know, when, when we start to map things like uh, the extent of the damage or the status of search and rescue operations, uh, we can provide situational overlays on the same maps that they're already using. So we don't create any confusion which, with, with uh, in, introducing maps that they haven't seen before. Uh, we train them on the use of the maps and then we provide the same maps during the event to show the, 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 the new information as the event unfolds. So what about lat long? This is a question that always comes up. Why don't we just use lat long? That's on GPS too. Well, there's some good reasons. Um, first of all, it's not intuitive. It's a base 60 system. There are 360 degrees around the world. There are 60 minutes in a degree. There are 60 seconds in a minute. Uh, it's a base 60 system. Uh, we don't really think in those kinds of terms. We always have to make the conversions and think about that. There are also several formats for that long. We can describe it as degrees, minutes, seconds. We can describe it as degrees, minutes, and decimal minutes, degrees and decimal degrees. It's very important to know which, which one we're using. And if we don't do it correctly with the degree symbols and the double ticks and the single tick and so on, um, it, it can create uh, uh, in, it, 
a very large amount of confusion on the on the part of somebody trying to interpret those locations. And there are stories out there of, of how that has happened, where somebody related as degrees, decimal degrees, and somebody interpreted it as degrees, minutes, seconds, or degrees, minutes, decimal, minutes, and you end up 50 miles away from where you're supposed to be. Um, so that can be a real problem. Plus, when we're talking about longitude, we can express a, a, a longitude uh, location as a positive number or a negative number, either, either east or west of the uh, prime meridian. Or we can say it's a west longitude or an east longitude. Well, if we describe it as a west longitude or a negative number, the numbers themselves actually increase from right to left, which is can be really confusing. So finally, how big is a degree? Well, the earth is round. Uh, that means that, uh, that, that the size of a degree can vary. Uh, at the equator, a degree of long longitude and degree of latitude is approximately 69 miles. Well, at, at, at our latitude in Dakota County, same as Wisconsin, um, a degree of, uh, of uh, longitude is about 50 miles, where a degree of latitude is still approximately 69 miles. So what happens is degrees of longitude actually get smaller as you get towards the pole where they converge. This makes distance calculations very difficult. Now, of course, we can all find the apps that'll give us the distance between two uh, uh, locations in lat long, of course, but you can't really visualize it very well. And I'm sure some people can do it longhand or with a calculator if they need to, um, but it, it, it's, it's still difficult. Um, so if, if really, if you think about it at a local level, a, well, the, other, the other point is how many, if you're doing it as degrees, minutes, seconds, or degrees, minutes, decimal, minutes, how many decimal places do you need to describe the location to a sufficient level of precision to get somebody there? You know, if you're only doing it to point to, to, to one decimal, decimal point in, uh, uh, in minutes, it's not going to get you very close. 10 meters is about half of a second in longitude at 45 degrees uh, and about 0.3 seconds of uh, latitude. So, you know, if you don't know that, you, you, you may not be providing enough digits to get somebody there. Well, when we're working with the US National Grid, we're working in meters all the time. Um, and this is because we're working with a Mercator projection. Um, so again, applying something that's, that's really complex that we understand about how to, how to map and measure on the surface of the earth and present that is done in a, in a, in a, in a consistent and, uh, and very logical fashion by all using the same thing. We all use UTM coordinates. We all use the UTM projection. This is reinforced by the land, land, land search and rescue, the National Search and Rescue Commit, Committee was created to create standards um, across multiple uh, federal agencies when they're all involved in search and rescue. And if we look, oops, that's supposed to have some animation there. Um, I can just point here. Um, if we look, all uh, land search and rescue operations are supposed to use the US National Grid as the primary uh, georeferencing system. Um, but now you notice that they are also supposed to use latitude longitude as a secondary geo, ge, geolocational system, specifically in the form of degrees, minutes, and decimal minutes, and that's important. Now, if we look at aeronautical search and rescue, um, there, latitude longitude is the primary location referencing system, and the U.S. National Grid is secondary. However, the addendum further states that any aeronautical resources that are supporting a ground-based operation will use the location referencing system of the ground operation, which is US National Grid. So this is what they're supposed to be doing. Now, it takes a lot, lot a long time for this kind of stuff to filter down, um, but it's, it's, it's really hitting home now and they're becoming familiar with it um, simply because it's reinforced by FEMA and a lot of the documentation in the incident command system um, and, and, the, and the national incident, incident management system all reinforce the use of the US national grid. 
So if we look at this in a little more detail, here we're looking at the, uh, uh, the one to 24,000 scale. Um, I didn't mention these are actually based on a 10 kilometer square. So that means that, they're, that, that this, the map extents for this map are um, right are, are, are aligned with the even 10,000 meter uh, increments of the UTM coordinate system. Um, so that creates a very logical ordering and organization to the maps. But I said we're going to we're going to create these maps ahead of time, and it's 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 presented as a map set or a map series, uh, and we teach them how to use these maps. You know, it used to be. And still is in some ways, you know, the emergency manager would give me a call and say, hey, we got this thing and we need a map that goes from here to there. And I need to see this kind of stuff and about this big. And we would go make that map. It'd be a custom map. Well, you know, we need to help them understand that they have all the maps that they need to get started without having me there or without calling me. And so if we think about an area of operation that maybe covers um, two maps. So now we've got two maps. We got an area of operation that that is really uh, covers both of those maps, or there's overlap between the two maps. They already have these maps in the emergency operations center in a drawer, or in their rolled up in their trunk, or something like that. It's very easy to teach them that they can make a wall map by simply cutting, trimming that map and taping the two together and st sticking it up on the wall. And now they can start to draw on that map with a marker or whatever, um, where how they're deploying resources, what is their understanding of the situation? So that now when I show up and I wanna start, I, I, I need to start creating these situational overlays or somehow putting, uh, modeling the, the event uh, and the resources in a GIS database, I can do that from a, an, an accurate source. They're already drawing on the maps that I gave them. Um, as opposed to the back of a napkin or on a whiteboard uh, where somebody's just scratching. They're using an, a, a precision tool to start to track their understanding of the situation. So that's very helpful. Very easy to take a series of these and then just tape them together and anybody can do it. Doesn't take a GIS professional to be able to make a wall map using uh, these different map series that are already in the drawer. That works very well. Also, all of these maps are available. We created maps for the entire state of Minnesota. Uh, we can put them into a web, web interface so that they're easily accessible. Uh, through an interactive map, you can zoom in, click on a, a given square, get the uh, PDF file, save it to your local device or, or print it or whatever you want to do. So the maps are available for the entire uh, state. You can also download them all and put them on a thumb drive. So you've got them in an emergency situation. And, and this is really what everybody needs to do. Don't rely on the internet. We think the internet's ubiquitous and it never goes away. Well, that can happen. Um, we can lose power. Um, and maybe I can't print them on my site, um, but if I have all the maps downloaded, it's pretty easy to give that thumb drive to somebody to take outside of the affected area where they do have power, go to a a, a Kinko's or some other printing service and, um, and, and print the maps that we need. So it doesn't take a GIS person to do this once, once you have that. Plus all of those, those larger scale maps, the one inch equals 500 foot, those are all eight and a half by 11. They're all out there as PDF files. And then we can organize them into map books so that uh, Apple Valley Fire Chief can go to the website, go click on Apple Valley and get the Apple Valley map book as, as an entire um, multi-page PDF file, and then ha save that as uh, as as a PDF on a thumb drive or or, or print print as needed. They can also open the multi-page PDF file, go to the page they need, and and print just that page. Of course, all of the USGS topo maps are US National Grid compliant. These are the seven and a half by seven and a half minute quadrangle, also referred to as quad maps. These are also one to twenty-four thousand scale. These are all geo PDF files as well, which means they have layering. I didn't mention all of the maps that we've created, the 10K maps and the 1, 1K maps are uh, also geo PDFs um, and they also have layers that you can turn on and off. So it really, by um, uh, 
uh, using these 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 PDF files, um, you really have a mini GIS inside of Adobe Acrobat Reader, um, and you can you know in Acrobat you can do the annotations and things like that there as well, and highlighting and so on. So really creates a um, uh, uh, kind of a poor, poor man's uh, GIS by just using these PDF files. Just an example of the layers. So all the PDF maps and map books uh, are um, downloadable. They can be saved locally. Um, it also means that we can automate the, the production. So Arc, ArcMap data-driven pages, ArcGIS Pro uh, map series. Um, we can just crank out the maps, put them in some kind of a map repository that are that's web accessible we can create interactive maps for uh, uh, finding individual pages uh, we can also use things like python scripting for putting the pages together into map books so that um, you know once you it, when you've done it once uh, and scripted it you simply create all the updated pages run your python script and all the map books get updated and pushed out to the website um, this gives us then map libraries that are transportable, standalone. You can print what you need when you need it, and anybody can do it. So first responders, emergency managers can get started. They can, they can provide direction to people to do what they need to do with these maps, and it doesn't take a GIS expert to do it. Um, not saying that we don't still have value, but it allows us to, when we engage, we can engage at a totally different level because now they already know how to use the maps. When we provide situational overlays, they're getting the same maps that they're already familiar with. Anything that they're annotating and tracking on those maps relates directly to, those are precision instruments. They relate directly to uh, what we know and, and we can start to model that stuff uh, very accurately. A um, variety of mobile apps also support the U.S. National Grid. Some of them integrate the camera. Um, some of them simply provide a, a grid reference location. Um, go find your favorite GPS app on your phone um, and look for this. Look in the settings. There are going to be a variety of of uh, options for the coordinate format, and um, it'll have either MGRS. A lot of them are starting to have U.S. National Grid now too. Uh, so that's that's really encouraging. But if it doesn't say U.S. National Grid, it'll say Military Grid or MGRS, and, and they're effectively synonymous. Um, events of PDF maps. You know, I mentioned that we create all our maps as geo PDFs. Um, there is an app out there called Avenza PDF Maps, and it allows you to import a geo PDF, and it will. Um, show your location using the location uh, referencing on your device it'll show your location on the map which is which is very useful so that means that now once you've downloaded a map and stored it on your on your local device um, you don't need the internet connection anymore you can simply open that pdf file you don't need the internet to be able to get your location when you're using um, using your mobile device um, so that's that's very useful and there are options for um, uh, dropping place marks and things like that. It's free for personal use. There's a small charge for, uh, for commercial and government use. Another app called Find Me SAR. SAR is search and rescue. Um, it's a it's a really uh, it's actually a, a website that you can go to. It's not an app, um, so you do need an internet connection to use this, but. It's very easy to remember. You go to findmesar.com. You can do this on your local machine as well. Um, and obviously you don't have locations unless you're using an iPad or something right now. Um, but then you have a number of options for how you display your location. And you can see that you can do it in both USNG, same as MGRS, or degrees, minutes, and uh, uh, decimal minutes. Oh, uh, no, this is doing, I'm sorry, degrees, minutes, decimal minutes. Oh, that's correct. Um, emergency location markers this is another standard. I think BJ is going to going to go in more detail on this, but it's another standard that uh, uh, lets us designate locations for 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 key key things like uh, uh, all of our you are here maps uh, uh, that are out uh, trail intersections, and it just shows your your U.S. National Grid location to precision of 10 meters. 
there is an app called another website app called usngapp.org. Um, and it'll actually, you can see in red, it's, it's showing the, uh, the, the degree of confidence that you have in your location. So if it's in red, you know, you, you may not want to rely on it too much. But again, it's showing eight digits, four, four digits in X and Y, which gives you a location to a precision of 10 meters. Um, that's going to be just fine for somebody finding you out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then there is actual an actual app called USNG app that you can download to your device. Uh, and then you don't need the internet connection once it's installed. I'm going to give a plug to Shared Geo here. That's a, uh, a, a nonprofit um, here in Minnesota that was created to really provide support for geospatial support for uh, uh, different projects. Uh, and they are a nonprofit and they are responsible for uh, both of these. Um, my, my USNG, this was actually created by uh, Esri. Um, but it is, uh, there is an effort um, to hand this off to Shared Geo as well. So they're taking that. Nice thing about my USNG, it also, also includes a map. That's kind of nice. Um, GIS Surfer, this is another, another application out there. This is uh, free GIS, again, free for personal use. Um, the developer of this, uh, it, it is a lot, it's, it's a, a very sophisticated, robust application, uh, internet mapping application, um, but it also does support the US National Grid uh, and a variety of other coordinate formats, but um, it does also show the US National Grid all the way down to 10 meters, which is pretty cool. And then it tracks your location, um, either the center of the map or your cursor location uh, in, the, in the lower, lower left corner there showing you um, where you are. You know, always remember that effectively you're talking about a square with the US National Grid, even in full precision, you're talking about a one meter square described by the coordinates of the lower left corner. Uh, so whichever number of digits that you're, you're using, um, it, it describes the, 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 uh, the, the precision of your location um, as well as the location itself. You can find more information about U.S. National Grid from a variety of other sources. It may not even say U.S. National Grid. It may not say MGRS. Um, there's a lot, a lot of stuff about, uh, you know, backcountry trekkers and uh, um, you know, hiking and things like that. Um, they're using USGS topo quads, uh, and it simply gives them instructions on how to do grid referencing. It's all the same thing. Uh, stuff out there for you know, prepper sites, as well as uh, military uh, study guides and things like that, um, all, all define how you, you do this grid referencing. Um, Iowa Task Force One has created some nice videos. Uh, I encourage you to go and explore this. Um, they're out on YouTube, but it's a private YouTube video. So you actually have to go to their website to, to get to the YouTube video. Um, but you can just do a Google search for Iowa Task Force One US National Grid and, and, you'll, and you'll find that. And, and they've got uh, really several different segments on how to use the US National Grid. And at, in, in a matter of a few minutes, they're actually doing a pretty good job of giving an overview, um, certainly enough for first responders to be able to use uh, maps and, and do grid referencing. I encourage you to explore that. Um, USNGcenter.org, this is a, a website that was created again by Shared Geo. This is the, um, the, the, the primary source of information related to the US National Grid. And I encourage you to check that out. Uh, from here, you can get to a variety of other sources and different kinds of information. Um, this is all uh, maintained by Shared Geo um, and uh, something that, that we can all contribute to as well. Encourage you to explore that. Um, and specifically, there is a, a place where you can go to actually get um, information about how to create U.S. NG map books with ArcMap. And so you can download the map book instructions. It'll take you through step by step, uh, including a, an, an MXD with the, the, the map layout, map templates, so you can create um, your own map books. I'll go into more detail on this in the, in the third segment of the workshop. Um, it goes through all the details. 
Um, also, the uh, uh, NAPSIG. Na NAPSIG is a national alliance for, uh, for public safety GIS professionals. It's another nonprofit, been around for a number of years. Um, they have provided a number of different um, resources and endorsements of the U.S. National Grid. I encourage you to check that out. Um, and specifically, if you, if you go down the website a little bit, there is a map template for creating USNG map books in ArcGIS Pro. And um, again, I'll, I'll touch on this in a little more detail uh, in, the, in the third segment, um, but it does go into a lot more detail. Um, uh, and, and it does also have, uh, make use of tasks in ArcGIS Pro to take you through step-by-step, step, which is kind of nice. The US National Grid Wiki page, I uh, encourage you to go there. Um, we've updated this, uh, spent a lot of time uh, adding a lot of information to this. We had, I'm involved in a work group um, that's working on, on these things nationally. And uh, um, somebody really took the time to go through uh, the Wiki page in detail and update it and provide a lot of linking to some of the other stuff that I already showed you. Um, how am I doing for time? I, I didn't keep track of when I started. Claire? This is BJ, I've got about 9.50, Randy. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Don't say that. All right. Uh, <laughs> oh, I might, you have well, to quit gonna, by I'm, noon. <laughs> I'm gonna tell a story. And I just, I didn't keep track. We started at what time? We started at nine? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. I'm almost done. I just want to tell a quick story. Um, you know, we I, I've been doing um, training for uh, for emergency managers, first responders, and you know, creating these maps and things like that. Um, and there is a uh, there's a there's a special group in um, Dakota County, and actually they're involved in multiple uh, jurisdictions called the Special Operations Team, and these are the elite in uh, um, the first responder community in Dakota County. They get involved in, you know, the high rope rescues and trench, trench collapse, um, building collapse, uh, hazardous materials and, and, and things like that. Um, and they have to actually apply and be recommended uh, to become a part of this team because they go into a lot of specialized training. And so these were uh, really, it was really key. They also then come from different organizations. So it was key to, 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 to give them training on the U.S. National Grid. And they're, also, they're always looking for these kinds of, uh, of, of technology. They want to use GIS and GPS and things like that. Um, and so I had given them training on the U.S. National Grid. Uh, you know, and, and, and there are different, different techniques that they use for search and rescue. Um, and one of the techniques, and really as a fallback, is a grid search. And uh, they would basically grid up an area uh, using some kind of a, of a method and then um, methodically go through the area. And, uh, and that's now being taught using the U.S. National Grid. So, so they have been taught about this. And then they actually got in, you know, there was this, this situation that happened where uh, somebody had wandered away from their home and uh, was missing. And it was, it was the middle of winter. It was very cold out. Um, and uh, there was a search team that was created uh, uh, very quickly. And they went through, there was this park uh, in, that, in that neighborhood. And they went through that park and, and they were not able to find, find anybody. And so then the next day, um, they got uh, law enforcement got involved. They had a canine unit. Um, they had a, a number of volunteers that, that were involved, and they went through this park, and they were not successful. So, so then they called the special operations team. Special operations team came out. They had their command vehicle. That's the green square up here, um, and. Uh, they, uh, they, had, they, they, they were able to ask for a map. They, asked, they, they wanted to have a map that they could use for, to use with the U.S. National Grid. Um, and they went out to do this grid search. And, and, and they said, you know, we don't need to do this grid search. We're just going to go out and, and, and we're just going to do what we do and, and, and it'll be okay. And they went out and it, there, the underbrush was so thick with uh, uh, buckthorn and things like that, that they couldn't stay on a line. They couldn't keep track of which direction they were going. They, they came back to the command vehicle and said, okay, let's figure it out. They broke out their GPS receivers. They broke out their map. And 
and uh, they set they set it up so they had a GPS receiver on each side of their search line. They had a line of 10 people separated 10 meters apart, and they were able to go through 100 meter squares methodically, and they were able to simply watch their GPS, and when that digit changed, they, 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 they knew that they were going into the next 100 meter square. They were also able to stay on a line because the other number shouldn't change as they're, as they're moving. So they were able to go through um, the, this entire area methodically and the, the red represents the areas, the squares as they uh, completed them. And they were able to call back to the command vehicle, say 881-620 clear. And they could mark that one off and then they would go to the next one so on they went all the way through and um, they finally found the person unfortunately it was a sad situation and ended up being a victim um, but they were successful in that search after two other attempts really three other attempts had had failed and so that after that experience these became my champions in the county and and that was a huge uh, uh, step forward uh, because I was at, at, in other presentations where we were look, talking about things like implementing emergency location markers and things like that in front of police chiefs. And I, at one time I had my back to the wall trying to explain why we were using the US National Grid. And one of the key players that was at the meeting that's a member of the search operation team took over and won the argument for me. I didn't have to say anything. And, and that's huge. When you get the emergency managers and first responders to become champions of this, it's a win for everybody. And it puts us in a great situation then to do all the cool GIS stuff that we can do. ESRI is providing a lot of support for US National Grid. Um, there is a map service out there, uh, feature service that will uh, dis display a national grid overlay on your maps. I don't so much like the presentation of it, but it's there. It's kind of nice to plug it into uh into into an app um i oh, i don't have it on here but there is now a a uh a, a grid widget for um, um for for uh my goodness help me out web app builder <laughs> web app builder has a gridding widget so you can just drag that into your web app builder application and you can turn on the grid display and it actually does a very nice job of displaying the grid. Um, so momentum is building locally and nationally. You know, uh, Iowa has created uh, this, uh, the, the same kind of maps that we have in Minnesota. So they've got the 10K1 to 24,000 scale and the 1K1 to 6,000 6, scale. Um, Florida's done a bunch of stuff. You can see uh, again um, at the usngcenter.org, uh, there is an app out there that will show you maps and map books uh, that have been published around around the country. Um, this is actually an old an old screen grab. Uh, there are there are more now, and we're actually working on an application where um, you, where where anybody that can publish maps and register the maps with the application, so nobody actually has to do anything to make the maps uh, show up there. Um, Hurricane Harvey, this was quite, quite a while ago now, but, but one thing that was really interesting, this is a website that was created after Hurricane Harvey, Harvey uh, by the Homeland Infrastructure Foundation level data high field um, and very, uh, represented very prominently there are USNG map books and resources. So we're really starting to see the federal government um, represent the use of uh, US National Grid. So it was kind of corny slide, but this is, this is really, uh, you know, it's a, it was a, established as a federal standard. Um, it needs to be adopted at the, at the local level. And ultimately, I'm assuming everybody in the audience here are GIS professionals. It, we own this. This is on us. You know, um, it's a great door opener, as I said, to be able to have a reason to go and talk to your emergency manager, talk to the police chiefs and fire chiefs about what you can do. Um, explain, you know, this U.S. national grid thing that they're starting to see in their FEMA requirements and things like that and talk about what we can do to help with that. Um, but, but ultimately, as, GI, as, as geospatial professionals, we, we, we got to own this one. Um, we're the ones that, that, that need to help people understand why this is important and, and what we can do to support it. And really everything that we, that we have, all the technology we have supports this very nicely. Um, you know, and what you don't want 
is to have your emergency manager come and ask you about it. You know, take the step, go knock on the door, uh, build that relationship and uh, start the process of, uh, of, of helping um, the emergency response community within your jurisdiction understand what this is and uh, what it means and what you can do.